Hello everyone, happy Thursday and welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Jamie Hinkle, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Learning Inclusion Manager at PFLAG National. Uh, just like every week, I'm going to be hanging out with you in the comment section. So if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to share with our uh, speakers today, feel free to reach out on whatever platform you've joined us from. And again, as always, I'm going to bring in Jean Marie Nevetta, who's going to lead today's conversation. Hey, Hi. Nico. Hi. How are you doing? It's going good. I'm, I'm having sort of an existential crisis about calling it the coast or a beach now in my head, like we were just talking about. So. From our earlier conversation, yeah. there are so many options for language. And as no. West Coast transplants, we're a little confused. Right. And I mean, where you're from, you'd call it the shore, probably. It's true. So like, I got so many options, but that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> no, not, but it was something to, to start the show with. Yeah, absolutely. So I will see you soon. Thanks, Jamie. Hey everybody, my name is Jean Marie Nevetta. My pronouns are she and Aya, and I am the Director of Learning and Inclusion at PFLAG National. Every single week we get together to talk about something related to LGBTQ inclusion, and this week we are talking about Bi Health Week. So a few things before we get started. We definitely want you to go to straightforequality.org slash discussion series where you can get this week's article um, that we are actually discussing along with discussion questions. So if you wanna have this conversation with your friends, with your family and your workplace, you can host a conversation too. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of background to today's conversation. So as I mentioned, we are um, commemorating Bi Health Week. Um, it is something that is um, sponsored by um, the Bisexual Resource Center, which we're gonna be talking about today. It has a couple of goals. Um, it wants to raise awareness about the bisexual plus community's social, economic, and health disparities, advocate for resources, and inspire actions to improve the well being of bi plus people. Um, this year's theme is all about connection. And to make some of those connections and to really get this conversation going, I want to introduce our two guests. First, I would love to bring in Andrea Holland who is a nonprofit fundraising specialist, but also a member of the BRC Board of Directors. Hello, Andrea. Hello. And, and I'd also like to bring in Mackenzie Hart from PFLAG National, our fabulous learning and inclusion coordinator and a member of my team, which always makes me excited that we are all reunited here. So um, Andrea and Mackenzie, thank you so much for being with us this week. Thank so, you. Before we go into the conversation, because there is so much I think that we really need to get into, because I think there's a lot of misinformation in this space. I think there's a lot of um, people who are lacking resources in this space. Andrea, could you tell us a little bit about the Bisexual Resource Center? Yeah, so the Bisexual Resource Center, or BRC um, for short, uh, has been around since uh, 1985. So coming up on 40 years here in just a, in just a short time. Um, we have always been a resource and advocacy organization um, and also a connection organization. So we do have um, support, peer-led support groups um, and really just trying to build more community for uh, people who identify as bi plus. Fantastic. Um, so the article that we were looking at this week, which was in Prevention Magazine, had some statistics around the health experiences of people who are bi. And one of the ones that really stood out, stood out for me was this, which was that um, 33% of women who identify as bi, 39% of men who identify as bi are not out. Or we see that a lot of them are not out to their healthcare professionals. So a lot of people not disclosing information that's really, really important to actual healthcare outcomes. So there are lots of pretty scary statistics out there when it comes to bi plus people and experiences with the health care uh, system. So maybe Andrea, we could start with you and then Mackenzie, we can move down to you and talk about what some of those top line findings are that people should be aware of. Yeah, so um, uh, bisexual, bi plus people uh, make up the majority of the LGBTQIA plus spectrum but very, very few of us are either out or, um, or are open because not only do we face stigma from the heterosexual world, but we also face stigma within the LGBTQ community. Um, if you're a bisexual man, you're just too scared to come out as gay. Or if you're a bisexual woman, you need to pick a side and you're just, you're, you're having fun or it's a phase. Um, and so it's very difficult for us to, to come out all the time, all the time we're having to come out. So often we are also um, 
our sexual a preference or our sexual orientation is assumed based on the perceived gender of our partner. Um, so myself, I am married to a cishet man, a cisgender heterosexual male. Um, and so everybody assumes that I'm straight and it's just an assumption out there. And so I constantly have to come out um, and make that part of a proactive process that I do in my life. Um, and doing that constantly is just exhausting. And so um, with healthcare providers, but also with friends, family, coworkers, it's just this constant coming out process. And so that gets exhausting. And Mackenzie, how would you add on to that? I think those are some great points. I think that one part of the statistic that you mentioned, Jean Marie, is not necessarily that bi people don't want to come out to our medical providers. It's often that medical providers are not asking questions the right way. Mm -hmm. I remember in early high school, I had one doctor who I had not met before. I went to the same practice for many years, but he asked, oh, do you have a girlfriend? And I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. So I said, no. And then he said, oh, boyfriend. And I said, no, which, I mean, that was a little more progressive than some right. other doctors would have necessarily been, but it didn't give me any any way to answer because I wasn't in a relationship with anyone at the time. And so asking the question in that way can be really flawed. But I'd also mention that uh, some statistics about healthcare that go beyond just the medical portion of healthcare, but into mental health show that people who are bi plus tend to face higher rates of mood disorders, substance abuse, mental illness, and intimate partner violence, all things that are related to health and well being in some way. And I would, make, I would make sure to mention that that's not because we're bi plus, that's because we do have a kind of lack of access to resources as well as a lack of understanding about our identities, which makes it harder for us to be able to get the care that we need on all of these fronts. And so I think that's one thing that I want people to know that we do face very severe statistical disparities uh, across different forms of healthcare. And one way that we can see those disparities go down is by learning more about our community. I would love to, if we can, just for a couple of minutes, because this is something that we've been talking about a lot at PFLAG, is the experiences of bi plus people inside of LGBTQ spaces. Uh, so there is, as you said, Andrea, a lot of coming out. Um, for both of you, and I, and I imagine this might look a little bit different, what kind of responses do you hear inside of LGBTQ spaces, those spaces where I think a lot of us would like to assume that people are a bit more enlightened and accepting? And maybe, Andrea, we can start with you. Yeah, so um, just personally, I we see the gamut. We see people being very open and affirming. B is it one of the first four letters in the in the al in the shortened um, alphabet, and so there's very people people that accept accept us and um, and welcome us into the community. But there is that um, other minority within the LGBT that just, as I said, stereotypes. Um, they either think we're not gay enough or we're um, we're pretending, where it's a phase, um, we're not picking a side, so um, it's not helping the LGBTQ cause. We can, quote unquote, pass more um, in our relationships, and so we're not seen as, as visible. Um, I've heard that we are riding the coattails of the movement rather than being at the forefront. All of those different things um, I've heard in conversation in the LGBTQ um, community. It's really unfortunate. Mackenzie, what about you? I think that um, that everything that Andrea mentioned is true. I also think that we do see a lot of erasure of trans and non-binary people who are bi plus. I am an example of someone who's non-binary and identify with the word bisexual. Um, and so I think that that creates kind of this false stereotype that bi people are somehow not inclusive. And it leads to a lot of different kind of fights about language, which while language of course matters and using the right definitions and the right words is very important it's way more important to support people as they are. And a vast majority of people who use the word bi that I have met are either trans and non-binary themselves. A majority of trans and non-binary people actually identify as bisexual plus or are people that are inclusive of trans and non-binary people and have been, you know, some of the uh, some of the people in the front lines of the fight for LGBTQ equality alongside trans people for, for many, many decades. Um, so I think that that's one thing that does unfortunately come up that uh, we need that there needs to be more and better education on. But I think that everything that Andrea was saying was right that we do get told, oh, you're just, we get told the same things by LGBTQ people that we do by straight people that, you know, oh, it's just a phase. Oh, you're just not sure if you want to come out yet or oh, anything along those lines. And I think that that creates a lot of really negative, um, negative aspects of our identity. And one more, last thing I'll mention on this before I go is that, uh, before we move on to the next topic, is that in research that I've done, 
there's actually no statistical difference between levels of discrimination that we as bi people face in uh, gay and lesbian spaces as we do in straight spaces, which means that while we're excluded from uh, straight re resources for straight people, uh, the already limited um, resources for gay and lesbian people are also often closed off to us, which means that we have almost nowhere to go. And that's something that can be corrected. And that's something that um, there are definitely solutions for. And I think that education and understanding is that first step. I have to say, I have a lot of gratitude towards you, Mackenzie, for teaching me some of these things. And especially that last statistic that you mentioned, which to me was a tremendous wake up call because you know, I know what exclusion feels like, but knowing that you're getting excluded in every possible space that you can go into, especially those where we would think that you would find community is really disappointing. And if that isn't a call to action, I, I, I don't know exactly what would be. So can we talk a little bit about your own experiences with healthcare providers and how this has played out for you? Because I think, you know, there's a lot of conversation that we can have year round about bi visibility and the issues that people who are bi plus are facing. Um, but this is very much focused on that healthcare experience. So, um, Andrea, we'll start with you. We'll go to Mackenzie too. Have you had some positive experiences with healthcare providers, or maybe have there been some negative ones? And what did those sound and feel like? How did it change your relationship to the healthcare system? Yeah, um, that's a good question. On I positive experiences, um, I am struggling honestly to think of one. Um, I also is similar to Mackenzie. I'm also uh, non-binary as well. Um, and so there's uh, both physical um, discrimination based on that, but also, again, I am assumed straight because of the relationship that I happen to be in. And so the questions that healthcare providers are often asking me are geared towards somebody who would identify as straight. And they're not necessarily asking me those questions that would get to um other issues that I might be having because of either my sexual orientation or my gender identity. Um, and so it's really just having the understanding that assuming somebody's sexual orientation or gender by look alone or by relationship status um, is not helpful to anyone and things are being missed um, for people in terms of health disparities. We have uh, higher rates of cancer in uh, bi plus the community, obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular health, all of these physical manifestations of health, as well as mental health, as, as McKinsey mentioned, depression, anxiety, all of the um, minority stress just causes so many issues um, in the bi plus community. And so healthcare providers not having that understanding and coming in with assumptions rather than being open and asking the right questions just exacerbates the problem. Yeah. And Mackenzie, what about you? I know that you did mention your one experience, that one experience with a doctor. Um, what has it been like for you? Um, and how has this shown up? And, and how has it influenced in some ways the way you even approach healthcare providers when you are in those settings? I, I've had some positive experiences, um, which was that one doctor I had asked a question along the lines of, if you were seeking out a relationship, and I apologize for the noise down my street, which is a trend this week, um, but I was asked, you know, if you were seeking out relationships or relations, uh, would you be seeking that, them out with women, men, or both? And I think that was kind of how it was phrased. And obviously there is the aspect of, you know, not being inclusive of multiple genders there beyond just men and women, but it was a way that my doctor was able to show me that, oh, you know, she's at least aware of this. And this is something that, you know, she's one, not asking me very specific questions or, framing it in such a way, but she is being inclusive. And so that from that point on, I felt safer with that doctor because I knew that, you know, she was aware of, of different things that would come up and aware partially of how to ask that question. That was several years ago. So I feel like if that were to happen that way, again, I would probably take a moment to say, hey, you know, here's a better way to ask that question, but I really appreciate it. Uh, but it made me feel safer. But I have had more unfortunately, negative experiences with doctors, like the one experience I mentioned, there was a period in college in which I went to the university health center for something, and I had a rainbow hairband on or something. And once the nurse noticed, she then asked me a very inappropriate sexual question that had nothing to do with what I was in for. I think I had like a joint injury or something. It was something very much not related. And so at that point, I was like, uh, no, that's not how you should be asking that question. That's and I did take that moment because it was so over the line and she genuinely didn't mean anything wrong by it. And I hope she grew after it. 
Um, but then I've also had experiences where I went to a doctor that uh, a majority of his clientele were a cis gay men. And I went simply because I hadn't gone to the doctor in a while and I just needed a quick checkup. And I remember him be kind of mansplaining to me about crap and about different about different things. And I was saying, no, I I do work in the space. I understand. I'm telling you what I what I don't need and what I do need. And you're not listening. And instead, he was kind of pushing me on the path that he would push his other patients on, um, making that assumption about me that you know isn't is not fair and was not effective for the healthcare that I needed at that point in time. But all of that to say, when my doctor that was inclusive was, it made me feel really good. And I mean, it's been several years and I still talk about it because it was such an example of, you know, almost the right thing to do. Almost the right thing to do. Almost. I like how we celebrate the almost the right thing to do these days. We'll take what we can get and continue to push. So how do we start educating healthcare providers? So what are some of those things, those basic things? I mean, I, I think, Mackenzie, you identified a big one, which is how questions are asked. What are the questions that you are asking? What are the words that you're using? And what are the assumptions behind those questions? Um, but Andrea, again, maybe we can start with you. What are some of the changes that healthcare providers can make um, to the way they are doing business, essentially, and interacting with their patients that would move the needle forward in terms of inclusion? Yeah, I think um, exactly what you and Mackenzie just said, just being aware of those biases, those internal biases that you might have. You see you, you see the world in a, in a certain lens. We all do. Um, and just being aware that not everybody fits that lens that you're looking through um, and treating everybody the same while sounds great is not equitable. We can talk about equality versus equ uh, equitability. Is that a word? Equitability. Um, it doesn't can sound be right. Here. It is, it is now, um, but uh, just realizing that again, how I look and the person that I am in a relationship with, whether I'm in a relationship or not, you cannot tell my sexuality or my gender or any of those things just by looking at me and my relationship. And so that baseline understanding and just like everybody really needs to just sit with themselves and understand that and kind of that mental shift needs to happen within the healthcare community, but just in general. Um, and then again, just being open to listening to your patients rather than Les McKenzie said that doctor was trying to steer them down a particular path because they had these preconceived notions rather than listening to them and what they were saying um, and what they were, were trying to communicate. And so being more open and understanding with your patients and actually listening to what they're saying, I think it would go a long way. I, I love the phrase um, that somebody taught me many years ago, cultural humility. Um, it's not just about being competent in it. It's about being humble enough to actually hear what people are saying to you. And know that no two experiences are quite the same. You can know generalities, but they don't necessarily, can't necessarily drive your behaviors in every case. Mackenzie, what about you? Suggestions that you would have? How would you build on to that? I think that I would build onto it by saying that it needs to be across the board. And, and talking about bisexuality is obviously what we're here to do today, but I think that we see similar uh, mistakes being made for so many different categories. I know that there have been studies done that doctors tend not to listen to women, cis women, when they talk about the pain that they're facing, that they always kind of undervalue that, and it leads to worse issues. We know that um, that Black women in maternity wards tend to die at significantly higher rates because they're not, you know, treated with the same level of care, and we see that that applies racially. I think that we see it with um, with uh, with ability level as well, that if someone who might have a disability and is not as able to communicate, then they might not be listened to or the same level of care might not be put in, or they might be show pushed in with other people with similar conditions. Um, and then I've also had friends who are transgender that, you know, have medical issues, and then they're told, oh, it's either because of the hormones you're on or because of mental issues and kind of ignoring the um, what's actually happening because, oh, it's this. And then, of course, there's issues of size as well, that if someone is considered overweight, doctors are likely going to blame many different issues on the weight when that might not be the case. Maybe it might, you know, add to it because there are different problems that come with different eight weight groups, but people who are considered overweight do get ignored. So I think that you know, talking about bisexuality specifically as part of this is really important, but I think that we need to see kind of an across the board level of proficiency and understanding for anyone who doesn't fit the already um, 
established uh, categories of person that doctors tend to be trained in uh, handling. Yeah. And I mean, I think education has to do a lot with that. I mean, medical schools are starting to understand the role of cultural competence and humility a lot more. But I think that it's taking a while to kind of filter down to everybody's everyday experiences. So, you know, by Health Month and, and, and talking about what we were talking about and, and paying attention to this issue is not just about healthcare providers. It is also about what we can do every single day in our interactions with our own healthcare providers, whether somebody identifies as bi plus or not. So Andrea, you know, we have all of our P-flaggers out there who watch and listen. They love getting involved in stuff. They love a good project. Um, what are some of the things that like the everyday advocate can do, especially when they are visiting the doctor? Are there any things that they should be paying attention to and maybe conversations that they can queue up with healthcare providers? Because sometimes the privilege of it not being about you gives you a little bit more space to work um, comfortably. Any suggestions for people? Um, yeah, I mean, exactly what you said, having conversations with your healthcare provider, if you're noticing um, either biased language, or again, to Mackenzie's point, it doesn't necessarily have to be bi plus, but if they're ignoring you because you're a woman, and you're in your pain levels, or you're whatever the case may be, speaking up for yourself, I know that can be scary. Um, especially if you're not feeling safe, I would never advocate for anybody to speak up if they're not feeling safe in a situation. But if they, if you feel safe enough and you uh, are have the agency to say something, absolutely encourage that. We also have resources on our our website, the buyresource.org, um, about talking to your healthcare providers about safe sex in particular. Um, again, this is geared more towards bi plus people, but it's it's pretty standard across the board questions that you could be asking your healthcare provider. There's also some resources for healthcare providers on um, what they should be paying attention to when they have bi plus. Um, identified individuals in their care. Um, so pl lots of resources on our website, but just having the conversations and speaking up when you see, when you see something it goes a long way, I think. And really, I would encourage everybody to check out the resources. There's some really, really good content up there and it is very um, accessible, very digestible and very easy to use. Um, you don't have, it, it, it doesn't take a heavy lift and I really love things that immediately give you something to work with. Um, Mackenzie, anything that you'd add on to that for again, the everyday activist? I think that outside of healthcare situations, uh, just continuing, just growing as an ally, better understanding different bi perspectives, uh, and pushing for bi inclusivity in, um, in policies, in culture, in media coverage is one of the most important things to do because that creates awareness, which hopefully creates more understanding, uh, which will eventually impact, impact healthcare and make sure that that is something that's being paid attention to. Uh, but making sure that you're being as inclusive as possible in your personal life and also in your public and political and media life as well. So you have flawlessly queued up a transition to the next question, of course. Thank you so much. Did not plan it, but it shows that we are all in sync today, which makes me very happy as it feels like the world sometimes is spinning out of control. So one of the parts of the article for, that we were reading this week that I found really interesting was that the author talked about um, their own experiences as a person who is bi and, and healthcare experiences and talks about the disparities that are often experienced as um, first, because there's a lot of ignorance around these issues. Um, also, there is outright discrimination, but there was also quite a bit of conversation in the article about um, representation and seeing yourself and how important it is that people who are bi plus have lots of examples of people like them that they can access in all walks of life. So, um, and that that lack of representation um, makes it harder to get into these conversations sometimes. So I would love to know from both of you, um, what was the, was there an impact to you of not seeing people like you? And, and if you did see people like you who helped you understand your identity, who was that and how did it feel? What did it bring you to? Because I think sometimes people don't understand how very important finding someone who has a similar background is. And maybe Mackenzie, we'll start with you on this one and then go to Andrea. I think one thing that I learned is that there's not a lack of people who are bi, and, and we see this in the statistics generally too, but there's a lack of coverage about people who are bi. I realized early on that, you know, many people who I already knew and respected who were famous, uh, or at least semi-famous, were by and some of them even use that language and were out. You know, Billy Joe Armstrong, the lead singer of Green Day, Vanessa Carlton, the piano player, musician, um, 
and several others. Lady Gaga is probably one of the lead examples, but so rarely are they talked about accurately. Um, and so I think what that kind of showed me was that, you know, there's just a severe lack of understanding and a lack of respect and a lack of under and a lack of language use that really plays out in a harmful way. And that's why it, that's why I found it important to constantly reaffirm the language that I use and my identity. Um, but I think that it also showed me that some people really, really struggle with understanding bisexuality as a concept, which, if I'm being honest, makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't, I don't understand why, you know, not, not judging your partner based solely on socially constructed gender roles or, or biologically constructed um, sexes. I don't understand why that's not the norm, first of all, but that's just my own radical thing. Uh, but I don't understand people who really don't understand it because it, to me, it's just, the, it's the way of going about relationships that it's like, yes, if you're going to be with multiple people throughout your life, which most people who are not, most people who are aloromantic tend to be, then you're not necessarily going to be with the same exact type of person every time. And that's almost what, uh, what people kind of express when they're questioning bisexuality. And I just don't know if it's just just poorly considered or if it's just my own very unique way of seeing the world. But that's what that kind of taught me that, you know, there are many, many people who identify as bi plus, but that doesn't mean that we're all being talked about accurately. And that's why we need to kind of do that work ourselves. I think Lady Gaga is one of those great examples where I constantly see her on non-LGBTQ ally lists and then I see her on them and it keeps going back and forth. And I'm like, she actually does have an identity and it is permanent. Um, Andrea, what about you? Yeah, um, growing up, I definitely, if there, when there was, by, I'm, I'm thinking TV shows, movies, not just celebrities, but just um, in terms of representation of characters, there really wasn't a lot. Um, and when there was, it was negative or stereotypes or not people that I wanted to see myself as. Um, people that were, their trope was that they were just promiscuous and would sleep with whatever and was cheating on everybody. It was that hypersexualization of, of bi people or they were untrustworthy or whatever the case may be, all of the negative stereotypes that we, that we battle every day. And so growing up in the mid nineties, and trying to understand my own, like, I didn't really, I only saw negativity if, if I saw it at all. Again, it was very rare that you would see anybody that openly um, was a, a bisexual character or a bi plus character, but when they were, it was, it was in a negative way. Um, and it really wasn't until late 2010s, uh, like 2017 was a big, um, when Rosa Diaz came out as bi plus on uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, in a very positive and just kind of like matter of fact way. She was like, oh, I'm dating a woman. Didn't you know I was bi? And then they, the show just kind of kept going with it and just having that normalization. It wasn't, it wasn't negatively stereotyped, but it also wasn't overly like publicized. It was just like, this is who she is and that's part of her character. And then they moved on. Um, and I thought that was incredibly important, just showing the normalization of people having multiple partners, but also different gendered or, or different people as partners. Um, I still find it wild that we even need to talk to it, talk about it as normalizing because it is the most normal thing ever. People have different partners through their lives, and yet it feels like there is this extra hurdle that you are grappling with, and it it, it really does feel so incredibly unfair um, and questioned in such a, a different way than it is in other spaces. Um, we are almost out of time. I'm getting my warning that we've got to start wrapping up our conversation, but I want to say this is definitely not the final time that we are talking about this. Um, please make sure that everybody is checking in um, with the Bioresource Center. Jamie is scrolling the link at the bottom of the page um, and check out those resources, share those resources and have these conversations. Um, Andrea, Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for everything that you're doing and how you're educating people like me too. Thank you. Well, we are almost to the end of another show. Um, I need to remind everybody that we are still, still doing PFLAG's Read With Love campaign. So if you would like to learn more about our Read With Love campaign, campaign please visit pflag.org slash readwithlove. And right now we have some uh, great books around bi identities on the screen right now that you should definitely check out if you'd like to know more. We will be back next week with a really fantastic show once again. I want to thank everybody for joining us. 
Um, as we wrap up the same way every single week, we remind you to run fast, laugh hard, and most of all, be kind. Please get vaccinated. Please do what you need to do to be safe um, so we can be together again sometime soon. If you need help, please visit pflag.org slash find to locate your nearest chapter. And we will see you next week on Something to Talk About Live. Bye, everybody.